Recently, I ran into some problems with my existing storage solution. I used to store my files on 3.5 inch SATA hard drives that I would simply dock into a SATA to USB 3 adapter. I manually created copies of my important files and was honestly quite happy with this approach. It was cheap and relatively easy to live with. However, I started working on my own businesses some time ago and for a couple of reasons this storage system is no longer feasible. I had to look for a new solution and decided to build a network attached storage, for short a NAS myself. So I started looking for a system that ticked all the boxes and after quite some time settled on a modified version of the NAS that Linus Tactics built about half a year ago. In this video I want to show you around the system, explain what the upsides of a NAS solution are, tell you about my experiences with it and point out the modifications that I made so that it perfectly fits my needs. Let's dive right into it. There are at least three significant upsides of using a NAS. Storage cost, storage redundancy and remote access to your data. Let's start with storage cost. Upgrading a Mac Studio to 8TB will run you 2760 euros here in Germany. Granted, that's pricey and very fast storage, probably some of the most expensive storage you can get. But the system I'm showing you today will run you around 2000 euros and has 16TB of usable storage, roughly double that of the Mac Studio. The cost of the mass storage is around 500 euros in this configuration. So more importantly, you can expand it to essentially any capacity for the cost of just upgrading the hard drives. For example, a configuration that holds about 32 terabyte of usable storage would run you around 2,500 euros. And going all the way up to 100 terabyte will cost you around 4,200 euros all in all. You might say that these cost savings come from storing the data on hard drives, which means that you'll get less performance than out of the Mac Studio drives. And yes, that's absolutely true. But on the system that I'm showing you today, I can still edit 4K video off of this storage without issues. And you could still go with SATA SSDs to get speeds of theoretically up to 1.25 gigabyte per second both ways. The second point is storage redundancy. Well, if the hard drive in your computer dies, the data on it dies with it and is probably unrecoverable. At least not for a price that makes sense to a normal user. For some use cases, this is quite fine and it's still possible to create backups of your data to external hard drives or to cloud storage. But these approaches come with additional complexity, additional limitations and additional cost. The storage configuration in this NAS is currently set up so that one drive can fail without any data getting lost at all. One could easily set it up to allow for two drive failures while sacrificing some more usable storage. On top of that, my server uploads some of the most critical datasets to cloud storage and encrypts them on the client side to make sure that the data is still securely stored there even if my house burns down or something like that. It also acts as a backup target for a few files that I store locally on my computer, all fully automatically. Finally, because the server is always on and running, it is ideal as a remote access point to all your data. Please be careful how you set up your network to keep it secure. Personally, I use a VPN to access my local network remotely and then run the normal SMB protocol to access my data remotely. But other configurations are of course feasible and there are plenty of tutorials all over the internet showing how to set up all kinds of remote access. There are even more reasons why getting a NAS can be a good idea. Just to list a few, it can act as a virtual machine host, it can act as a media and transcode server, it can orchestrate your smart home and many more. Basically, it's a general purpose server that you get to use for anything that you can think of. With the reasons for why you should consider a NAS out of the way, let's see what I built into my particular NAS. This build is heavily inspired by one that Linus Tech Tips created about half a year ago. You can find the link to their build guide below. I think their configuration is actually ideal for home and small business use, but there are a couple of things that I wanted to change and we'll go through them as we look at the system. So let's start with the case. It's called the Johnsbow N1 and it's honestly the ideal case to build a NAS in, in my opinion. It's quite compact, has acceptable airflow and can be stored either upright or laid down. It comes with some front I.O. but for a NAS you really at most need a USB port for local copies. Given the speed of the networking in this particular NAS and the speed of a USB 3 interface, however, it doesn't really make sense to connect anything directly to it. You'd probably rather connect your source to another computer on the network and then transfer the files more comfortably using the SMB protocol. 
So let's open it up and look at the individual components inside. The motherboard I chose is identical to the one that LTT chose. It's an Asus ROG Strix B550i Mini ITX motherboard. The cool thing is that it comes with 2.5 gigabit per second LAN on board. I wasn't sure when building it if 2.5 gigabit per second would be enough for my use case, and so I decided to go with it first, run some tests and potentially upgrade to 10 gigabit down the line. Spoiler alert, I actually did. This board also comes with two M.2 connections, which is quite crucial to make the storage configuration work. One is actually on the back of the motherboard, so you can't currently see it. The other one is in the front and hosts a SATA HBA. In the M.2 slot on the back, I currently run a Samsung 980 SSD with 512GB of storage as a cache drive. I probably would choose a different SSD at this point, as this one seems to have software issues that occasionally report 84 degrees of temperature, while the disk is actually idle and has been for multiple hours. It's not enough of a problem for me to switch it out at this point, I'd have to take the whole motherboard out and everything. But just know that going for a different SSD might make your life a bit easier here. The CPU in this build is definitely a point to discuss for a minute. LTT chose a AMD Ryzen 3100. This is a pretty cheap chip that would serve you well in a NAS like this. However, I wanted a chip with onboard graphics for a couple of reasons. First, it simplifies the OS install quite a bit, and secondly, I wanted to have it for potential future use in, for example, virtual machines or transcode applications. Now this is the point where my main problem with this configuration came up. I really wanted to run error correcting memory. The reason for this is that ZFS, the disk management and file system that I'm using, heavily relies on storing data in RAM, even for longer periods of time. This can potentially lead to compromised data in the case of bit flips in RAM. Now granted, the risks are arguably relatively low, but for me it wasn't worth taking them, especially given that I'm building a dedicated storage server anyway, and that the cost of using ECC memory is really only ever so slightly higher than using non-ECC memory. The problem with ECC memory is that it's not fully supported by all CPUs. On the Intel side of things, things are already quite confusing if you ask me, but they are even more complicated on the AMD side to some degree. Basically, every Ryzen CPU has untested support for ECC. This means that LTT's Ryzen 3100 should work fine with ECC memory. No guarantees from AMD though. The B550i motherboard that I and LTT used will also support ECC fine, so I'm not quite sure why LTT didn't use ECC memory, it would have worked just fine with their setup. However, things get more complicated when you want integrated graphics, or what AMD calls an APU instead of a CPU. Here, ECC support is deactivated on all models except for the Pro lineup of APUs. On those, however, there's even official validated support from what I understand. So all good then, just buy an APU and end of story. Well, not so fast, actually. AMD isn't selling the Pro APUs directly to customers, but only to system integrators. So getting one was quite the hassle. I finally managed to track down a Ryzen Pro 5650G from a local hardware seller, and then paired it with 32GB of 3200 mega transfers RAM from Mushkin. This is honestly too much for the storage applications that I'm running on this server. The CPU never cracks around 10% of usage while accessing the storage, and you should calculate roughly 1 GB of RAM per 1 TB of usable storage on ZFS, so 16 TB would have been fine in my case. In fact, I first ran the server with 16 GB as a test, and it worked perfectly. However, when running virtual machines in addition, 16 GB is just too little, and so I decided to go with 32 GB in the end. This, by the way, also enables dual-channel access to the RAM and should increase performance a tiny bit. Let's go over the remaining components in this system. I went with the EVGA 550 GM SFX power supply that LTT spec'd, mostly because I don't have much experience with power supplies and I wanted something that works, that's efficient and it's from a reputable brand. Honestly, it's probably overkill for the system, but it served me well during the past weeks of usage and I don't expect any issues with it in the long term. The operating system is stored on this single Corsair 250GB SATA SSD. I would have preferred to run the operating system on another disk in parallel to ensure uptime if the drive fails. However, I currently don't have another SATA port available and also no native mounting space for another SSD in this case. Also, this doesn't affect data integrity negatively in any way, and it's really only an issue for uptime. So maybe I'll switch to HBA at some point for one with more ports and then add another small SSD as a backup boot drive somewhere in this enclosure, but for now I think it's fine. For networking, I chose an Intel 550 10 gigabit per second network interface card. It just plugged right in and worked without issues. Finally, I chose five 4TB Seagate IronWolf drives, totaling 20TB of raw storage. 
In the configuration I use them in, I sacrifice one drive worth of capacity for redundancy and I end up with 16 terabytes of usable storage. I expect that this should last me for a couple of years at least, and once the time comes, I can always upgrade the system to up to 100 terabytes of raw storage. So that's been it for the hardware, let's talk about the software side of things. When it comes to software for such storage systems, there are a few different choices that one could make. For me, the choice was quite clear and I went with TrueNAS Scale. It uses ZFS as a disk management and file system. It's free, developed by a reputable company and offers all the features that I could possibly need. Scale is quite new to be honest, but in contrast to Core, which is based on BSD, it is based on Linux and hence has much greater support for hardware and software. For instance, you can easily run Docker containers on this thing and you can set it up with virtual machines. It's really a breeze, super easy. Another alternative could have been Unraid. However, Unraid is not free and uses ButterFS, which for my purposes isn't as well suited as ZFS. Surely there are many other ways on the software side, but to me TrueNAS Scale seems like the way to go. Let me know in the comments if you think something else would be a better fit for the system. In terms of configuration, I opted for a RAID Z2 configuration for my disks, giving me data integrity with up to one disk failure. Once you have TrueNAS set up, you can safely disconnect all the displays from the machine and it'll run just fine. All it really needs is power and networking. I access all my shares using the SMB protocol. One of the many cool things that ZFS can do is that you get to specify how each dataset should behave. So some of my datasets are encrypted for data security, some are not for performance. Then some datasets use a stronger compression to save space on data that I access rarely, sacrificing performance, while others use no compression at all to maximize performance while sacrificing disk space. This means that once everything is set up, I don't have to think about anything when using the storage. I just create projects in my project datasets where they aren't compressed and I work at full performance. Once I'm done, I just move them to the archive dataset where they are compressed heavily to save space. For added integrity, I have two measures set up. Most of my datasets have snapshot tasks attached to them. This means that the file system will create virtual copies of these datasets and keep them for a specified amount of time. Legally relevant documents will be held for the amount of time required by law, even if I delete them. Other datasets will keep their snapshots for a few weeks or months so that I can recover accidentally deleted files and protect myself against ransomware attacks. Some of my datasets are automatically uploaded to cloud storage. These uploads are encrypted on the server before they are sent their way to ensure that they can't be read on the cloud storage. There are a few more things that didn't find space anywhere else in the video, so here they go. There's a trade-off that you're making by using consumer hardware, such as this B550i motherboard. You are saving money by not buying server-grade hardware, but you are also sacrificing features that might be useful in this application, such as redundant power supply support and an IPMI interface. However, since I host this machine in my flat where I essentially have access whenever I need it, and given that I don't rely on the 24-7 availability of the data on the system, I don't absolutely need those features, and they aren't worth the additional cost for me at least. Going with the server motherboard would almost inevitably mean that I'd need to run another case and I would likely need to spend significantly more money for a less tailored system in this particular case. So I'm truly happy with the choices I made here. Then, in the past weeks of using the system, I spent quite some time with the TrueNAS support and their technical team. The main reason was honestly on me. I was running macOS Ventura on one of my machines and until a recent version of this beta, which resolved this issue, there was a bug that prevented macOS Ventura from properly reading and writing from and to the shares on TrueNAS. The TrueNAS team was incredibly responsive in debugging the issue with me and even provided a workaround on their side with a custom SMB executable that enabled these buggy versions of macOS Ventura to work with the TrueNAS shares. I'm mentioning this to point out the big upside of sourcing the software for your system from a reputable company with loads of experience. This is the way to go if you need your systems to run. And finally, I want to point out a couple of downsides of the John's Point 1 case. It's been great all around, but I've had some small alignment issues with the PCIe slot on my motherboard, and it definitely does lack dust filtration. Given that this system and systems like it probably run 24 seven for most people, this definitely will increase the maintenance effort, as you will probably have to clean it a couple of times a year. All right, so this is all I wanted to show you today, and I hope you enjoyed this overview of my NAS build. Thanks to Linus Tech Tips for showing off this cool build. It's been a pleasure having you in my channel. If you found this video helpful, I'd appreciate a click on the like button below and I invite you to subscribe to my channel for more videos such as this one. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next video.